been working on the show? Like, how long has the idea been floating around? Quite a while. Um, I mean, this particular thing started uh, pretty much because of well, uh, Bob Boylan, a conversation. Bob Boylan from NPR. Um, he does uh, all uh, songs considered, yeah. and and he came to um, one of our shows, uh, a caroling thing, and afterwards he kind of winked and he was like if you ever have any ideas for something let yeah. me know and that's exactly what you want somebody to tell you well I was I didn't know what he meant <laughs> <laughs> I was just like what yeah okay but uh, but I was obviously and then he was leaving because he said goodbye to me and then he ended up not getting out for a while and then as he was just going out the door we saw each other again and he said it again and winked again <laughs> and suddenly I was just like oh my god what does he mean if I ever have a, an idea for something because like I hadn't you know I mean, the weird thing about this show is that I've been kind of making things like this since yeah. I was a kid and wanting to make things like this since I was a kid, but th there was no place in the world for this yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. thing at all. I mean, until two years ago, there was no place in the yeah. world for something like this, you know, in my lifetime. And so I just started daydreaming, thinking like, well, what could I tell Bob? Like, what could I make and, and, and ask Bob if I guess he could put on his show? I didn't even know what he was thinking, you know? You were thinking live setting? I didn't know what. I mean, no, no. I, I was thinking make something for the for radio yeah, somehow, yeah. but I just didn't know what he had in mind. And in a way, it was a it was a complete blessing because I just imagined anything that I wanted. And yeah. then I just wrote him an email about it, and I was like, ah, uh, there's a show called The Orbiting Human Circus, yeah. and and he was just like, great, do it, make it, you know. And and then I was like, well, I didn't know what that meant either. Yeah. You know, I was like, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Does that mean, like, I was still, so I kind of knew that we were, like, making this thing, and I thought we were making it for him. Um, but then, like, it just grew and grew and grew, and I kind of had this idea in the back of my head that, like, his show was a half hour, and our episodes were almost over a half hour, and I was like, well, how could we be on his show if our show's longer than his show? Yeah. And, and but I just kept, at that point, I was just making it, and we, and it was just happening, you know, for a long time. I mean, over a long time, and it was just this idea of what, now. You were, what do you mean you are making it? Well, I started recording it. I started oh. writing it and uh, started kind of making little s parts of the show. Because yeah. I just thought I'd make it. Because I was used to that model, like with yeah. making records, you know, especially with a wonderful, for a wonderful label like um, our record label Merge. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just make something and you send it to them and say, <laughs> here's the record, you know, and they go, cool. I mean, thank God that yeah. luckily they've always gone, well, that's great. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll they give it a release date. And, and, and so I was kind of used to like, well, you make the piece of art and then someone will get it out there somehow. Yeah. Um, but, and so we kind of started on this process of creating the show and over that time, like, the podcast culture sort of exploded in this weird way like by that by the time we had something made there was all of a sudden like a place in the world for it mm. which there totally was yeah. not you know before yeah I mean I I, I you know I, I've seen you perform I, um, I've seen you know the music tapes perform several times and it I mean this it seems like a logical extension of some of that at least I mean it's a very it's always been a really theatrical show. You have set pieces, and this this, this seems it, it seemed to me like this was kind of growing out of that in a way. Yeah, I think so. Except I think in a weird way, the music tips and and just the stuff I made coming up in in, in indie rock in a weird way was almost like a slightly repressed version of. I mean, only so much could fit. We were already yeah. a square peg in a in yeah, a round yeah. hole, and so as much of like what. Um, came naturally to me to make I did through that because that was the outlet I had for sharing things with the world and, and in a way that it could functionally entertain somebody mm -hmm. or someone could enjoy it because this all didn't exist then the way it does now podcast culture wasn't at that place yet and because like the first things I ever made like when I was a teenager you know on my four track in my bedroom was somewhere between the records I made but a lot closer to like what we're doing now to the Orbiting Human Circus mm. and and you know we did make a, a story record that was kind of like you know the Second Imaginary Symphony yeah. that also like Merge loved it yeah. and they wanted to put it out but it just has never it never actually happened because I think in the back of their minds they sort of were like well who would buy this <laughs> you know <laughs> like like you know they just didn't know how it worked yeah you know 
and they'd already sort of gotten really excited about my singing Saw Christmas record and yeah. like cre- made like a million copies of it thinking like everyone's going to want a singing <laughs> Saw Christmas record. My mom loves it for, for the record. Well, you say hi to your mom for me and, 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 and yeah. thank the Lord for her, but there weren't millions of people sure. who wanted to hear a singing Saw Christmas record in 1998. Yeah. 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 I have high hopes for like, or that was 2008. But anyway, so so what? When 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 you talk about a theatrical record, what does that mean? Does that mean actual um, stories in between songs? Yeah. Well, it was it, stories would kind of happen. I mean, songs would kind of happen in the context of the stories, mm-hmm. but it was they were kind of like concept records, which you know, obviously, Elephant Six was all yeah. in many ways, much way, many ways became about yeah. concept records too. But it was like they were concept records, except. Instead of Sergeant Pepper just being sort of like an idea that was threaded through, yeah. you were actually like in Sergeant Pepper's world, and Sergeant yeah. Pepper would talk, and and there would be a narrative that you'd really follow through the record in a very linear, like narrative kind of way. Because I look at something like, um, like you know, like Olivia Tremor controls record, and it sort of seems like. I, I could be totally wrong in this, but it, it it always seems like you know they had a bunch, you know, they had a handful of really good songs, and then they decided to try to form that into a more cohesive narrative, you know, like fit it into a story versus it sounds like what you're talking about is to almost start with a story and then build songs on top of that. Well, I think, I think my, my relationship to narrative was different than, um, like Will and, and Bill's from Olivia Turner yeah. Control because, um, I think for them, you know, the, 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 the beauty of, of um, especially Will's expression in that band is uh, is and was uh, just pure abstraction. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's creating something yeah. that brings you immediately into a place of that of your own pure imagination mm-hmm. because it's it there is nothing linear necessarily yeah. about it. Sound so they collage were and, right, and, yeah. and 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 the words were kind of created in a way that that didn't trouble you with linearity yeah. you know and <laughs> yeah. for me i've i've always been deeply enamored with story like a mm. narrative and to me like I've, I've always i've we always i think we all want to bring somebody to that place of like complete immersion and to a certain degree you're bringing them to a place of abstraction because that's mm-hmm. where you leave space for their own imagination for them yeah. to become a part of it and enter into it but i always wanted to do that by telling someone a story yeah, you know, a real like a real story. It, it it seems like Jeff might be more in in their camp on on that front, right? I mean, there's certain there's certain themes that you can point to in like Airplane Over the Sea, for example, but it's not it's not a concept record in the same way as you're describing. No, no, yeah, Jeff and 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 Will um, were birds of a feather. Yeah, like yeah, you know, sure. it was and and their whole way of making up lyrics was it was um, you know, I mean, it's something a lot more meaningful and soulful and directly expressive than I think a lot of people interpret this phrase to be describing, but it's stream of consciousness Mm -hmm. is a way to describe the process. I think, you know, letting, letting things come. And I mean, that's what I do. I just let things come and they just come all by themselves. As far as I'm concerned, I just write down what's coming, but it, but it's always a very, a very straight narrative for the, for them. It's almost, it's, it's almost the sound informing the words or, you know, the way, the way something sounds as you're singing it. I don't know. I, that, I don't, not to disagree with no, you, no, no, but no. I, but in I a mean, way, you know better than I would. Yeah, no, yeah. but that's not how I, the way that I see it though, is that, you know, I, well, I, there's different ways to, what we're trying to do when we tell someone a story mm-hmm. is you're trying to share, um, a feeling and, and and if it's a wonderful yeah. story the infinity that exists behind that mm-hmm. feeling because words are just placeholders for for much greater yeah. the building know, of worlds yeah it's yeah. like they're much a, a word is just a, a, a little s- signpost and beneath that signpost is is mm. the, the vast thing that that word is expressing and you know i think that a nice model for um, communicating feeling or or, or um, giving people an opportunity to be absorbed is like the hypnotic model hmm. uh, in hypnosis. Mm-hmm. Um, there are different ways to do that. One way to, to, to help somebody get into a state of complete absorption is just to tell them a story that they can just lose themselves in and, and get absorbed in and, and, and enjoy. the. W- Another way to hypnotize somebody very quickly is to say a bunch of things that don't make any linear sense, hmm. but that are clearly communicating something. To let them very fill the specifically, dots in. yeah. Well, yeah. 
when we become confused but we know that something meaningful is being expressed yeah. v very meaningfully we search yeah. like we search for what's being expressed the state of searching the state of is a it's a learning state yeah. it's the it's a state of absorption it's the hypnotic state and you, and you search for the way that these these ideas are putting out there fit together and and what the the through line is between those and, and what story you're building from these kind of seemingly dissonant ideas yeah well it's like a conduit the words are a conduit yeah. for the feeling and I think there's just a lot of ways to get there you can you can deliver words um, out of order in a way that somebody will understand ex exactly what you're mm -hmm. trying to communicate and 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 the point is communicating yeah you know so so that's, I guess that was the thing I always felt like sometimes with those kinds of lyrics like with Jeff or with Will sometimes people would be like oh they're just making up any old thing yeah. and it's so absolutely not that and and most abstract art that's any good is the absolute ab opposite of that it's somebody very sincerely very meaningfully trying to communicate something in a way that if you can go to it at all mm. or accept it will be so rewarding and, but, but you, know, you have to as, a, as an artist you have to sort of um, be able to let go of that right you have to let people interpret things the way that they will you can't you can't be too uh too precious about your own interpretations of something well you know that's com communication you know you you have something s sincere to express yeah you have the inspiration to s express it sincerely and then it leaves you and yeah. that's what communication it's is it's theirs, it's now, theirs. Right? Yeah. yeah and it's and 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 their experiencing of it is half the thing mm -hmm. And it's just as valid as as your your expression, but it's out of your control at that point, and and that's f wonderful. I'm I'm actually a little curious what you thought about this because when <clears throat> when the the podcast was first announced and a lot of people picked it up, uh, you know, obviously your best known project right now is Neutral Milk Hotel, right? I mean, they're it's it's such a giant phenomenon. Um, so when when it's announced that you're working on a new project, it's Julian Coster of Neutral Milk Hotel, and and I saw you know I saw a few. A few things came out from, um, you know, might have been like Stereogram or something, where they said, "Well, it, this sounds like a very neutral Milk Hotel project." I don't know if you saw the write-ups that said that, um, and I'm curious what you think about that because, you know, like you said, your your form of storytelling and Jeff's form of storytelling are different. Um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm imagining that he was kind of the driving force behind all of the narratives when it came to Neutral Milk Hotel. Um, are you able to see that connection that people are making? Why they would describe your project as sounding like like a neutral milk hotel esque project? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I don't think the the person who wrote that article had heard the show. Sure, but but um, I mean, no, I understand it perfectly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's more about our culture and and how our culture. Really, it's about publicity in our culture and how publicity <laughs> in our culture works, which is yeah. just if I walked out of this building yeah. after I left you and got hit by a car, they would write Julian Coster of Neutral Milk Hotel yeah. got hit by a car. Although at this point they might <laughs> write <laughs> Orbiting Human Sarcas on Neutral Milk Hotel. But, yeah. but three weeks ago they would have written Julian Coster from Neutral Milk yeah. Hotel because that's who, that's who I am. The biggest group of people, which is all that any publicity mechanism is just desperately trying to get everything to the biggest group of people they're trying to put out anything that the biggest group of people will recognize instantly that's all so so in a way it's just you know it's kind of like if you know if Paul McCartney yeah. did something they wouldn't say the guy who wrote Ram yeah. you know yeah. they'd say yeah. Paul McCartney from the Beatles sure. um, but but may, you know may, maybe I mean maybe a better way of phrasing it though is uh, do, you know do, do you do you under do, do you do you see as somebody who's who's inside of it do you see um, consistency with the way with, with the imagery that Jeff uses with with Neutral Milk Hotel as a band and the stuff that you create independently. Do, do you feel like there's a there, there's a connection there? Well, I mean, we we are so close, and we certainly all of us in I mean, in Elephant Six definitely inspired each other, and yeah. and and you, we can all look at each other's work and trace elements of where you know our influences on that and and unquestionably like my friends influences are on the things that I make and my influences is on theirs so in that respect definitely and obviously we were friends because we loved a lot of the yeah, same yeah, yeah. things you yeah. know so um 
I've never thought about it before, but I think that, you know, and especially when we were younger, I mean, it's hilarious that all of our art was as incredibly different from each other as it actually yeah. was. Like, people's attempts to, like, make it one... Because we were kind of a movement, but yeah. to, to pretend that we were all, like, you know, I don't know what they used to say, like, 60s or something. Yeah, 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 it was yeah, like, yeah. are you Beach kidding Boys. me? It's like, have you listened yeah. to this? It's yeah. like the, the, the Neutral Milk Hotel had nothing to do with the Beach Boys. Yeah. Um, but it's like... Except that there were a lot of instruments. That might be the one, <laughs> the one there through was, line. There, well, there was something before the Beach Boys called orchestras sure, that I'm, had a I've, lot I've, of I've, instruments. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard rumors. And I love the Beach yeah. Boys, I should say. But I... I um, no, I, I think that... Um, I think it makes a good story yeah. and it's comforting to lump things together into movements, but I think the surrealists sure. or, you know, the, but I think that when you actually start looking at the Dadaists work or the yeah. surrealists work or the expressionists work or, or, or elephant six or anything else, it's actually all really different yeah. because people are really different, you know? Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting too the, the form of storytelling, um, as far as, you know, the difference between being able to just kind of put ideas out there. I mean, there's a little bit more in something like this where there is a really direct narrative. Um, there, there ends up being a little bit more hand-holding, right? I mean, you end up having to explain things a, a little bit more directly. It's just a different, I mean, obviously, it's an entirely different form of storytelling than you're probably used to, or at least from what we've heard from you. Yeah, probably more from what I've gotten to do um, on record. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, people expect mostly songs on record, so I was definitely trying to sure. oblige. Sure. But, um, you and know. you like songs? You like making I love, songs? I love songs. Yeah. I'm crazy about them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I you know, because I've always told stories live, and, and, I, and I've always wanted to share more story stuff. But again, it's yeah. like it didn't have a place in the world. I don't think you could make The Urban Human Circus and sell it as an indie record. No yeah. one would understand. Uh, and, but... Um, oh, I mean, it's a wonderful medium. I mean, this medium is amazing because, um, as especially as an, a, a fictional narrative medium, because it's like writing a novel or creating a movie or something, but it's it, it has what novels have in the sense that, like, the images that people are seeing and the, the, the pictures and the actual world they're creating with their own imagination. Yeah. And, and so it's like, you can lovingly create something and and put as much time as you want to in it and that I'm used to from making records you mm -hmm. know you can spend hundreds of hours putting the tiniest little detail in there that someone will hear someday yeah after the 20th lesson yeah and they get all of that and then they build this world and it kind of and so it it's it's wonderful and I think the fact that it's an auditory medium is very special um, and and certainly yeah there's in terms of what you're saying about the the hand holding it's like you have to be very conscious of like you're giving people an opportunity to picture something mm. so you want to give them the chance to picture it and enjoy it before you move on yeah. you know and so you learn a lot of lessons like that when you're really trying to make it because uh and people are also learning how to, you know, engage in it in a weird way. I have a feeling what's going to happen with our show is that people are going to get used to listening to how it works, and then we'll be able to take things further and further. Yeah, because it'll be like shorthand, you know. You do get you get you do get that the first time you listen to something like this, like where it's just an entirely different experience. Where you, it, it, it takes you a couple minutes to kind of get your bearings, right? I mean, it takes you a couple minutes to figure out like the journey that you're going on. To, to start connecting those and to start kind of building that world from these things that, you know, I mean, there's the, the more straightforward form of, of it is you've, you've got this narrator who I guess is a voice in your head, at least as far as we know now, um, but then sound effects and then, you know, and you're, 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 you're building something really complex here and it's clear immediately and it's hard to contextualize as a listener, as somebody who's only getting auditory information because you're kind of doing a world upon a world upon a world right yeah, yeah. so 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 you know the, ba the the on the base level we've we've got you or your character or you know julian um who may or may not be had this voice in his head who's serving as our narrator and there's a radio show and he wants to be involved in the radio show but then it's also made clear to us that he's kind of got a radio show going on in his head at the same time um did, 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 
did you want to scale back any of that? I mean, it's it's incredibly ambitious, and it's a lot to to throw somebody at, at somebody all at once. Well, you know, there's a couple of things at play. I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm amazed by the reception it's gotten yeah. because we're kind of asking people to listen to podcasts yeah. in a different way. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't like. I mean, I've heard people are driving listening to it, but I wouldn't recommend driving <laughs> listening to it. I mean, it, it feels really dangerous yeah. to me because it's really and and people. I mean, I think people a lot of the ways that people listen to podcasts, you know, like you're doing something else. Yeah, yeah. And this, I think, I was cleaning is, my kitchen. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that in a weird way, this invites you to to get more absorbed in it the way you would like in your bedroom listening to a record or yeah. something or a movie or. And there are people who listen to podcasts that way for sure, obviously, but. I almost thought at first there'd be a ton of people who'd be like, what is this? Yeah. Because in a sense, like anytime you ask some people, say like, here's a thing you can relate to in a different way than you're yeah. used to relating to this thing. But you're, lu you're but, lucky, I mean, you're lucky in that you had something like Night Vale to serve as a basis to, to kind of get, to, 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 to bring those people in, right? I mean, if yeah. you listen to Night Vale and you know what it is, that this isn't too much of a step from there. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's wonderful. I mean, the way that, everything fell together is kind of magical but no in, in terms of like giving people um, layer upon layer of, of I like to talk about it's almost like you're presenting realities and you're presenting one layer of reality yeah. and then in that reality is another layer of reality yeah. and in that reality is another la layer of reality um, that's always I feel like that's always an invitation to, to go into something very deeply mm. and the things that I love I always want to go into very deeply mm -hmm. I'm always so grateful to have an opportunity to go further into something that I love. And, and, you know, if we're honest with ourselves about art, we're just making it for the people who love it. Yeah. We want people to love it. And yeah. you hope as many people as possible can love it. And being inclusive is always really important to me. Like, I never actually wanted to be an avant-garde artist. I actually do want to make things that anyone can enjoy. But if they love it, I want there to be a lot there yeah. for them to enjoy. I, I want them to be able to really get lost in it. I think mostly because when I was a kid art that I could get lost in was like a life raft hmm. you know like it was everything to me I mean to be able to lose myself in something was really important and that kind of made me who I was as a person and I still do that yeah I have less need to I don't want to I don't want to you know to draw too many parallels between you and your character but I mean you you just brought up a really obvious one and you go into this in the first episode about um, his fascination or your fascination with the medium started as escapism right i mean he 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 grew really interested in radio because he he needed to get away from something my, my fascination with all mediums was escapism <laughs> and probably remains yeah. to, as it remains escapism yeah, yeah. And, and i mean and, and in a <clears throat> sense isn't the ultimate form of escapism creative escapism literally putting yourself into that project making yourself the main character of that project <laughs> right yeah i mean you're bringing yeah. other people along with you yeah. but you're like all right now i'm 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 living in this fantasy well if you if you end up being a funny you know a funny bird like me then <laughs> you know then you need you still need a function yeah. in the world and so luckily I, I think i might i might have stumbled upon a function in yeah. the world uh but you have to con do something you have to contribute something to the do, you, do you do you feel like this is a pure form of what you've been kind of working toward all along in a way yeah yeah i mean i always felt a little bit i mean i was in i feel like you're talking about layers upon layers yeah. in a weird way like we were almost in the genre of what you would call like outsider art but i always felt kind of like an outsider there too i, I was i just feel like a layer you're upon an layer outsider of, among of outsiders. Outsider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah. I, you know i don't know because even when like you know i feel like for a while you know we experienced the very bizarre phenomena of elephant six feeling kind of cool yeah and i feel like i could look at jeff and be like yeah jeff's cool yeah I, I was never cool. I'm not cool. I'm just not. And I and there's, that's just, you know, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in a weird way, this feels, I mean, this feels exactly like what I want to make right now and what I ought to be making right now. And I honestly can't tell you how grateful I am that there's a place in the world for it because is, I'm used to there not being one. Is there, I mean, do, do you, you know, not not that this isn't isn't an end in and of itself, but I mean, do you feel like you're still working toward an ideal, a, a perfect project for you? Do do you still feel like you know that that there's something that's even more suited to your special set of skills than than the one you're working on now? I mean, I don't know if there's 
I think an arrival, an actual arrival in life would be a horrific thing yeah. for anybody. I mean, I think the of whole actually point, seeing things to their conclusion. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I don't think that really exists in a weird way. I think yeah. it's an illusion that humans like to create for themselves. It's like a carrot on a stick, yeah. but we need it as a carrot on the stick. Yeah. If we ever got to the carrot, yeah. I mean, think about how horrible that would be. You'd eat the carrot, and there'd be no more carrot, and you'd just be stuck. But does, but, you know? but is part of that being, I mean, it, it, does that mean that there's always a little bit of disappointment in everything you create because it's not quite your perfect vision of something? No, no, okay. no. No, what it is for me is that I'm I'm a dreamer by nature. I need my dreams to be really big and really enticing and definitely out of my reach, yeah. but right in front of me. And that's how I feel like happy as a human like yeah. that's how I can exist well because I get really excited about them I fall in love with the ideas and I move towards them and I feel like life is a motion you know actual actual life is just motion yeah and so it's kind of that motion you know and, and it's being uh, it's being inspired it's being in, in entranced uh, and um, yeah I don't want to possess things I don't I feel like um, having things is is just a weird illusion. It's like being able to look at things and 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 sort of be in awe of them. I mean, whether they're people in your life or things in your environment, or things that you feel like somehow you ought to try and do but you don't know how. I think it's the awe yeah. that is the actual real. Thing yeah. like the awe is real life. That's love. That's like that's what is actually real, and everything else is just. I mean, you know. It, 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 I mean, is a sense though that if you're ever like really, really happy, really satisfied with something that you've completely addressed that need, that you might just sort of stop creating because there's not <laughs> there's maybe not a next step. No, I never feel like no nah, because I don't. The way that creativity the way that i experience creativity is that it's and it's an outpouring from someplace else hmm. and i'm just anytime i make up something that i know i love yeah it just comes and i'm amazed it fe it you feels know, it I feels feel different like, than forcing yourself to work well i don't yeah um but but I but no I never feel like I did it especially if it's really good yeah I mean meaning I love it yeah I don't feel like I did that hmm. I don't feel like like oh I know how I did that I decided to do this then I decided to do that it just comes and 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 those moments are you know wonderful you know yeah. just wonderful it's it's you know just like it's just like any other moment it's like a moment of like pure you know being or, or, or enjoyment of life mm -hmm. you know and and this thing comes in and I just kind of go like wow but I all I want is to be in that state for as long as I'm alive yeah. and and to be a good you know like a good gardener it's like loving a garden you know I just want to be a good faithful gardener and I, I want to make you know a healthy garden yeah and something that 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 feels like it's a nice thing that it's there that it, it can mean something to somebody and 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 help support the people that work in it, garden in it. <laughs> but but so so if the pleasure is largely derived from from the creation or those or those moments, um, is it, are, are you also to, able to derive pleasure from having created the thing, having the thing out in the world? Well, I think so. I mean, it's always different, yeah. and sometimes you're just not there. It's like you make a record, sure, and you're not there yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. i mean if if wherever there is yeah i mean it's like the well there like where the record is i yeah, guess in yeah. a way it's like you know like what you know and then of course you people die and they're they're there they are singing on a little disc you know and it's like what the things that i love mean to me the moments i mean i was driving around here's a rock and roll example you know i was i was the other, not i wasn't driving i was walking around the other day but i started thinking about tom verlaine and television yeah and and I was just thinking about like I was like, okay, so Tom Verlaine's like walking around in the same city as me right now, yeah, and he couldn't have any conception how much that record 
meant to me and what it did for me when I was a teenager. And then six years ago, when I was, you know, I was going through a rough time for a little while, and, yeah. and I listened to that record constantly yeah. when I was driving around. Is and that it's Marky like, Moon? yeah, Mar yeah. Marky Moon, and and well, I, I love I love all of his music, but I. You know, it's like he has no idea. Yeah. He could never know. So, I mean, I think in a weird way, it's like when you put something out in the world, you don't know. What's cool about this show, though, yeah. is that there's a lot more of a sense of, like, people... Um, the characters kind of live and the story kind of lives and you sort of get more of a sense that like the character is out there living in other people's imaginations the world is and yeah. you you know I've been people have been sending me pictures that like folks have been drawing huh. like of the characters and scenes of the world and they're amazing yeah and I never thought that would I mean it never occurred to me in a million years yeah. that that would happen and I love it I'm just like wow that's like that's there they are and that's some that's evidence of it's in someone else's imagination and that's really beautiful and i think that's a real privilege for sure um and i love performing live beyond beyond you know the obviously like the obvious financial concerns of living in in the world and, and making art how how important is it that you know that people are out there consuming this i mean you know, it seems like at a certain point this isn't true for everybody but at a certain point most artists if they realize that like people aren't enjoying their art that you know maybe it's kind of time to to move on i mean do you need to know that people are out there listening to it that 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 it is like having that effect or an effect on people for you to really kind of keep making it in earnest no i'm um, not making the art um because i would do that if i was yeah. i mean if i was in a cardboard box right now on a street, which I, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought there was an excellent chance I'd in a cardboard <laughs> box, um, sleeping on the street. But I, I, I mean, I thought either somehow I would end up being what doing this, or what I've done, in whatever my life, this is, or I thought I'd end up homeless. Like yeah. it was like one or the other because I didn't have any other skills. <laughs> um, so I think you picked the right road. Oh, I, I mean, you know, I was shooting. If I would have yeah. shot for this, yeah. no matter what, it's just a question of whether you make, you know. But I, but I, I, I um. And I'm not that far removed from the cardboard <laughs> box either, but right now. But um, but no, I I um, it's definitely not. I think you make things like this because of what I described. Because it's it's just one of the most. It's one of the nicest feelings in the world to go into something and let let it come to be a conduit for. Yeah. These kinds of things. Uh, you know, if it's your nature, whatever it is your nature to make, it's like to be a conduit for those things is its own, you know, it's the greatest reward in yeah. the world is just having it come. So I would do it no matter what. But there's another level of it, which is huge to me, which is just, yeah, I've always wanted and dreamed of feeling like, you know, I mean, you want to feel like, um, I've always wanted to feel like, yes, I can bake bread and that people can eat the bread and and that will keep them from being hungry and and mm. and the bread will taste good and and that'll make them happy yeah. and i make the bread and and i exist in the world and i'm doing something like like i just and and so it was always very painful for me to be afraid that to not have any idea if the things that i could make would would have a a place or a use yeah, for people in the world, and and for some reason, instinctively, I very much have wanted it to have a place in the use in, in the world. Um, but so there's that for sure. But but to sort of to stretch that analogy a little bit, um, you know, if 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 for example, the people want a different flavor of bread, are you more inclined to change the recipe? Oh, I couldn't. And besides, <laughs> I mean, that's not how the world is. The yeah. world is actually just made up. And and now the world that we're in now. Um, and the world that's coming, I think, is so, so much more reflective of this truth, which is there's an infinite variety of sure. people out there who need an infinite variety of things. Yeah. So I think if the bread that you're making is, is real and, uh, and sincere and honest and you care and you put a lot of care into it, the people who want to, to have that bread will exist for sure. Um, you know, it's always been a question of whether they'd ever find out you were making it, mm -hmm. or they could get to it, or you could get it to them. Um, and I think the world now, it's it's becoming a much easier place for people to find things. But I, I, I guess the question, though, is, you know, as as somebody who's creating different kinds of art in, in, in different mediums, um, 
you know, let, let's say the, 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 the tide turns a little bit and people are suddenly more interested in the records that you're making, um, you know, insofar as you can continue doing, doing art the way that you want to do art, um, how much of a factor does what people are actually like consuming play in which direction you decide to head in? So far, none. <laughs> um. <laughs> but, but you, but but it's funny though because I think you're finally at a point where like where that might actually that that choice might actually pop up because now you're trying something completely different. Well, I, I think you know, I think in a weird way, like, I mean, the fact that I've been able to, I've you know, I've, I've lived hand to mouth my whole life, and I, yeah. I and I really still am, um, and and I'm very used to that, and it's just felt like. I mean, in a weird way, it's funny. We were talking about Will Hart before again, yeah. and we were talking about Elephant Six. But it, we had a lot of conversations about these kinds of things when we were, you know, kids, and 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 they were really important conversations because, in a weird way, we were arming ourselves to survive, yeah. doing what we were doing. And I think I always just kind of felt like you could have a lot of faith in the thing that felt. I mean, if if you were following something that you loved and, and that you believed was some sort of loving expression that you could have faith that things would just work out <laughs> and somehow I have found that to be incredibly true not spectacularly but somehow yeah. I never ended up in that cardboard box and I really didn't plan like I didn't try I just kept doing the thing that felt like I, I should make yeah. and trying to make it I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that the, the, the Neutral Milk Hotel shows must have helped a lot, both from a standpoint of, like, you know, just the, the, the touring, but also you, you got to open for your own bands. I mean, that must have been, that must have been tremendous exposure Well, I, we you. didn't open for Neutral Milk, though. Um, oh, you were opening for Jeff. For Jeff, yeah. yeah no, so. but no one else, okay. Because um, you were playing with him on those shows. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, um, but no, I, well, I played on a couple of songs when he did his solo yeah. thing, but that was more just because I was there. Yeah. Um, but no, I... Um, Oh, well, I mean, it, yeah. If it wasn't for the Nutri Milk tour, this week I, I couldn't have made. I mean, it was it cost it cost a great deal to make the podcast, to make the Orbiting Human Circus, yeah. and also the live thing that we're doing. You know, um, and there were probably uh, and the so I, the, I've been. It allowed me because because of all the people that came to those shows, it, it's allowed me to kind of hmm. make these things. Yeah. But but um, but I just keep. Yeah, I mean it, that's. Where, you know, <laughs> you know, I I I I always found the the story of like Alfred Hitchcock making Psycho or something mm. very romantic. You know, like mortgaging his house yeah. to make Psycho, and you know Orson Welles or other people who. Yeah. I mean, I always you know found those things kind of romantic. And luckily, I think in a way, because I mean, I had other friends who you know thought that like who found like yeah you know like the Velvet Undergrounds, you know health habits romantic and and you know and and that you know i feel lucky that in a weird way i yeah. just you know throw all my money into clyde organs and yeah. janitor's carts yeah, you yeah, know versus, uh, yeah. but but let me tell you if you want to have a clyde organ built in england and put in a janitor's cart prepare to put <laughs> most of your savings into it yeah yeah um, i mean you, you're definitely it's, it's i i think i i think you were actually i was reading it i was reading an interview with you earlier today and I think this was before the podcast really happened, and I think you were talking about a tour, but you were describing, I think you were basically describing notebooks of like, of, of, of basically what happens if you just sort of let your imagination just completely run, run wild and, and how, how, how like immensely expensive it would be to actually like try to put one of those things on. But I think that you found a nice medium in podcasting in that, you know, that you're eight, like, I mean, it's one of the, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I, I love the medium and, and obviously like what I do is, is, is different, but I do, um, you know, I, 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 I really like the idea that you can create something huge with a pretty low premium because again, a lot of the heavy lifting is on the listener, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can build, you can build a world without building a world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, I love I love novels, yeah. you know, and 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 I certainly love radio. Um, but yeah, no, I mean that's that's part of the so much of the magic of it, because the world the world is very real and it's very rendered, you know. Yeah. Um, and 
I'm me, but the things I picture, like, when I read, like, like um, a Chekhov short story or something, like, I mentioned him because he's, like, one of my favorite writers in, yeah. in the world, especially his short stories, versus what I picture, like, when I read Bruno Schultz or something. Sure. Completely different. Yeah. But it's all coming out of my imagination. Yeah. I'm creating the pictures, but there's no totally different universes generated by my imagination, but it's like they got to render something that is also very real. It has a body also. Could 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 this could this sort of vague sense that you were you were building of, of the idea that became the podcast, could this have lived as an album? I probably would have made it as an album. Yeah. I don't know if anyone would have bought it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that yeah. wouldn't make it you know, I mean that's just how I've always you know, I, again it's like I was never I was never fortunate enough to be able to change my art to suit any, yeah. you know, to suit any, what I make, to suit any thing that's going on. Like, so what, what, what was the first piece of it? Was, was it the, um, is the variety show, is that the basis of, of everything for you? I think it kind of started with imagining the variety show and the Eiffel Tower, yeah. this particular thing. Um, and, but the janitor character also has been forming for an awfully long time. Mm. Yeah, I don't think, you know, it's like birth is like a, it's like when does birth begin? You know, it's like it's like when the, <laughs> it's not okay. you know, it's not that's, a conversation I'm not going to yeah, right like that's not that's right. Okay, never mind. Scratch that, <laughs> scratch that, and reverse it. Uh, but um, but no, it's like it's like when. <laughs> oh God, let's talk about abortion, <laughs> Julie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but no, no. Okay, so. I'm not sure. When exactly. is it okay to kill an idea? <laughs> oh, but no. So, but but definitely, you know, obviously that that character has been, yeah, in me for a long time. But but the character is you. I mean, you know, it, it's a it's a crazy thing because it is. But this is the first time that I've ever gotten to make a character. I think that can be um well taken in the way that some people have taken in the, the the character already um where it's like it does exist the gender exists outside of me mm. you know and that's uh really interesting you know um because it you know i, I came up sort of i mean when w i was also i've been good friends with john john cameron mitchell for for yeah. many many years uh and John did Hedwig in The Angry Inch, yeah. uh, and um, who was a drag character, obviously mm -hmm. a movie and, yeah. and a wonderful, uh, well, an off-Broadway show and a Broadway show. And um, but you know, John was kind of creating Hedwig when we were pals a million years ago, and I was around for a lot of that. And uh, also some of the other, uh, like Justin Bond. I don't know if you know Kiki and her, but um, like mm -hmm. some of the other kind of like people were doing really, really interesting things yeah. um, as drag queens in the uh, 90s uh, in New York and stuff and, and one thing I always thought was really interesting about that was that they were kind of creating these characters that were uh, outgrowths of themselves they were almost like heat, heightened versions of mm. themselves yeah I mean that's the whole point of drag really right it's just right. like it's like you're taking caricature it's a character but it's also like it's it's almost like your soul yeah you know your soul is very expressed in that yeah, character yeah, yeah. and in a weird way you're you're kind of vulnerable at the same time that you're projecting this really kind of powerful picture of yourself it's in maybe a more honest picture yeah. of yourself and and what was interesting to me is that a friend of mine once said you know something about my character <laughs> And I was like, what are you talking about, yeah. my character? And yeah. they were like, well, you know, like how you are on stage. And I was like, what do you mean, like yeah, how yeah, I am yeah, on yeah. stage? And, and she was like, well, you're, you know, in some ways you express things differently on stage than you do off stage. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. I had no idea what she was talking about. But then I started thinking about it and it's like, okay, yeah, on stage, I felt like I could be myself truly. Huh. Whereas I felt like so it's a heightened version of you. Well, or um, or the person I I was off stage, I would have described as a dulled version of me because I'm protecting yeah. myself. It's like if I walk into like a sandwich shop and I order a sandwich, I'm afraid, and I've grew up being afraid of someone yeah. going, "Look at that freak," yeah. or "Look at that weirdo," yeah. and and not being like normal or not being cool or not being like 
you know, manly or whatever yeah. it was, you know, that I was afraid of. So I would lower my voice a little bit and I would <laughs> try to be a little bit more serious yeah. and I would, you know, try to to just come in and be like in harmony with whatever I felt was there <laughs> so that I could be a, a non-disruptive participant in it. And yeah. in a weird way, that socialization, you know, you, you try to... Sure. Um, and also because I like making people comfortable. Yeah, it's a path, path know, it's of like, least resistance. Well, well, it's a path of least resistance, and people are more comfortable when they're comfortable. Yeah, they yeah. can be themselves more when they're comfortable. Um, they can really share a moment with you if they're comfortable. And, you know, challenging people has a place, but I also think that meeting people has a place. You know, yeah. um, coming in and saying, oh, I see you. I, I, I see how you talk and I, I see how you are expressing yourself and like I can come I can meet you to a certain degree so I feel like I was trying to be um, uh, you know whoever I am in in the world whereas when I went on stage it was like I almost felt like my soul could just like take over completely and I could just be whatever I was so that was how I understood it um, but then I started thinking about the, the drag queens and I kind of thought that was such an interesting thing because they, they really were consciously creating a conduit um, and I thought that was cool and I also you know I you know it's like I love Harpo Marx what does that mean I love Harpo Marx I've always loved Harpo Marx yeah. I know what Harpo's soul feels like yeah. I know that Harpo can make me laugh I know that Harpo can make me happy and I also know that Harpo Marx walked around with his family and he talked yeah. <laughs> without honking a horn, you know, yeah. and he didn't wear the wig and the yeah. top hat. And that was Harpo too. Yeah. But there's no question to me that that man's soul was as much in the body of whatever Harpo Marx was as it was in the body of the man himself. So in know? a sense, it's, it's in, I mean, that's part of the reason why it's important that this character has your name, that this character really is a version of you. Kind of, you know, it's, it's, the fact that he's heightened is is that obviously, you know, I'm not on, talking to you on the Eiffel Tower right now, sure. but I might be, <laughs> and that's the whole thing. Yeah, because I could be imagining this, but but that's but that's it. So it's like that's the nature of the reality in a nutshell. So what does it mean? I mean, I don't want to read too much into it, but I I can't avoid it. Like after having this conversation, what does it mean that you? Um, and, and maybe you and 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 or maybe this story and, and Hedwig share this too, but that that you've kind of cast yourself as an outsider in your own work. That that there is this really this super cool thing that that is just objectively really great and that you love that that you're outside. I mean, I, you know, again, is it <laughs> right? What you know, <laughs> is, is it super? Yeah. But am, am I am I being like am I being like too literal? Am I being too on the nose if I like draw the the parallel between that and and Elephant Six or Athens or Neutral Milk Hotel? I mean, I don't know if it... I mean, I think that's the parallel between me and just life. You know, <laughs> I've, I've, I've felt like... <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I'm i in awe of people who are able to accomplish things and yeah. do things. Um, I guess because I've always, felt a, I've always felt about myself that I could do what I could do and I just didn't know if that was useful, but I wanted very badly for it to be useful, but I was always very conscious of all the things I couldn't do. Yeah. And there's a lot of them, you know. I, I don't know if that ever, and I don't know if the feeling ever goes away, and this is, and, 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 I, and I, I definitely get this, and this is what happens. I mean, this is the downside of surrounding yourself with really, like, great and creative people, is that, like, I don't know if that feeling of kind of being a fraud almost <laughs> completely goes away, right? Well, I don't think it's I don't think it's a feeling of being a fraud at all. I think it's a feeling of of being yourself and just having only that you know it's like you sure. you you are you and but you don't get jealous of of people making like your your friends who are making really great art? No. God no. I love I love what they make and I love them, but I don't I don't get jealous of their art because I well, you don't get jealous I mean if real I think good uh, I think there's a couple of different kinds of I mean people call all kinds of things art and I the word art is sometimes too fancy but sure. I'll, I'll use it right now but it's like I feel like there are a lot of things that people get entertained by and impressed by that make you feel small 
as the listener like you you sit there and your choice is to be really impressed by it like wow this the person that made this is so clever and mm-hmm. so awesome yeah. and so cool and i think that you can feel really a part of it by being in on it yeah you're invited to be in on it you're invited to wear it like an awesome jacket yeah. like whoa where'd you get that awesome jacket um but i don't really think that's not what i would call art or that's not what has value to me mm. and that's not what has ever had value to me the kind of stuff that has value to me instantly just makes you feel wonderful mm. and you start having i mean the art that i love i just start having my own kinds of ideas for my own kinds of things mm. i get in- instantly inspired because i feel like i'm just being nurtured like uh, i'm being given nutrients and instantly yeah. i'm getting healthier and and i'm feeling and you just feel mm. You feel proud of the world that you are a part of, and that art isn't outside of you. It's just, it's a part of the the wonderful world that you are a part of. It, you're not out separate from it. So, um, you know, some the feeling that I was describing was more a feeling of, I mean, I I could more readily, honestly, apply it to like a bank president than I could to any of my friends. It was just people who could succeed in the world, in 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 all of these material. Uh, quantifiable ways that I knew I never could. It, that's mm. that's more the feeling of is just like um, someone who can start an awesome, an amazing bakery and everyone loves it yeah. and they they get you know whatever rich in your town and they're you know beloved citizens and you look at them and you're like wow well you boy that's yeah. so not what I am and that's so not sure. what I'm ever going to be and I kind of know it and so you're kind of in awe of of. Um, that kind of accomplishment but even that in a weird way is healthy too because i mean it's why not be in awe of, of yeah. you know but you can't but you but you're not a baker so you you you're, you can't you don't have that emotion of jealousy with somebody else's bread no but i still don't think you would i think i think how could you how could you i think if you're a baker if you're a real baker you love bread mm-hmm you love good bread crappy bread would depress you <laughs> and and millions of people eating wonder bread yeah. would make you miserable yeah. that makes you miserable good bread yeah no that's why you're a baker you love that's good true. bread you want the world, world to be full of good yeah. bread and you might look at that bakery and go man i wish i wasn't starving and so bad at like business that I can't do that because it would be so great to like be able to make a house and 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 take care of people and 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 not be a drain or yeah. whatever. But that's not jealousy of the bread. That's actually that's more you know. It, I don't even know if it's jealousy. It's just it's just like a sorrowful respect for skills that someone else has yeah. that you don't. But the bread, no, you love the bread if it's good. <laughs> the the um. <laughs> You know, and again, and again, this is just the idea that I've always kind of had a, as, as an outsider. But as somebody who, like, you know, did for a long time really kind of romanticize a lot of the music that was going on the scene of of, of all of six at the time, it just seemed like a really vibrant time, and a lot of people getting together and 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 and, and playing, and people feeding off of each other's creative energy. And I'm wondering, like, how. Um, if you're able to experience that at all in the same way in a city like New York. Um, well, New York has always been a kind of magical place for me. And yeah. actually, Neutral Milk Hotel started in New York City. Um, so because I, because I grew up here, I always had kind of my grandmother's house when she was alive was in mm. Queens. Um, uh, well, Nassau, I mean, yeah. uh, New Hyde Park, which is on the Queens Nassau border. Um, and the band started Playing, played together as a band for the first time in, in her basement, and we were all living in this tiny rent-stabilized apartment uh, in a place that is comically expensive now, but in, yeah. those, in those days it was $425 a month um, and split up by a great many people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was the size of this tiny room we're in right now, but um, but no, so New York has its own magic, and it's always had its own magic. It's changed a lot, but good Lord, Athens, Georgia has changed a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every place changes. Um no, there's all there's all kinds of different magic. I mean, New York City to me is like about New York City, and it's about my, you know, my father lives here, uh, and my father is uh, someone I love, and he's a jolly guy, and and uh, um, 
you know, I have a lot of good friends, people that I know and love here, and, and uh, you know, it's like I, I know this city in, in ways that it's, you know, it feels a, like a privilege to be here and almost vaguely appropriate that I can't really, you know, that I might not be able to stay because it's such a crazy expensive place yeah. and all that, but, you know. I, I, I do have to ask now, actually. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to picture this. I'm trying to picture you and all the guys in the band convening at your grandmother's house at her basement like what did she what did she make of what was going on my grandmother was did not have the best hearing okay. <laughs> so so she really couldn't hear much yeah. of it but i did you know i played saw for her like um i remember like um i remember distinctly playing saw i wonder if it was neutral milk was all there we were practicing but for some reason maybe Jeff played the guitar or something and I but I was kind of demonstrating the saw because I don't think she'd ever really listened to me play the saw before you know and and that was a really special memory she thought it you know she thought it was very funny and delightful I think it probably reminded her of vaudeville yeah. you know yeah. her childhood yeah. but my grandmother was always really super I mean she was so wonderful and and so deeply unconventional and she was certainly very supportive of us yeah. and of me making things always um and it was interesting because she had this really funny pragmatism. Like, there's this great story about her and my aunt when my aunt was a little girl on um, career day or something. Uh, she went in uh, for the parent teacher meeting, my grandmother did, and they asked her what um, she thought my aunt was most qualified to be or what path she should follow and my grandmother said circus queen <laughs> because my my because it runs in the family well, my aunt liked people she was good with people she was she liked to dance and she just you know my grandmother thought of her skill set and she was like oh circus queen and uh you know uh and she also kind of it was nice because when i tried to explain to my family that when I was like, you know, in my, my early mid teens, I kind of, I explained to my, that my family was like, okay, college. And I was like, yeah. well, I want to be a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was difficult to put across yeah. what that was. Yeah. Um, it still is difficult to put sure. across what a performance artist yeah, is yeah, to yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, Musicians, a including myself, but yeah, but I, I but no, at, at that point, performance artist was in my head uh, as the best way to, because, you know, like Laurie Anderson, I was like, yeah. okay, like, yeah. who can I, what do I, what do I naturally seem inclined to do? I was like, well, you know, I knew what BAM was at a very early age because mm. I grew up in New York, mm -hmm. you know, and I was kind of like, well, I'm probably more like the kind of person that would end up on at the stage at BAM yeah. than like, you know. And you did. I did, yeah. You that was it. crazy. That yeah. was that was um, six times so far <laughs> and counting. The, those are the best, some of the nicest nights of my yeah. life. I, I love and um, the crew, the 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 the, the hands at, the, at Bam are like some of the coolest people in the world. Like the the union hands, like the crew they have there. Uh, when we came back after like a year or whatever um, from. Jeff solo to the band. Yeah, when the music tapes yeah. uh, played with Jeff, um, you know, we have uh, the music tapes has a singing television yeah. and uh, seven foot tall metronome and all these things. Yep. And our singing, our singing, our singing television blew up the first sound check. And so the, all the stagehands were trying to fix it, you know, and he's called static. He has yeah. a name. He's sort of a, a character yeah. in the band. And, um, and so I came back, and it was like the stagehands like gave me hugs, and they asked how static was, <laughs> and I was just like, "Oh my God, you guys!" Or, I mean, anyway, that was yeah. a, an aside, but so so, and, and you know, we can we can end on this, but I'm I'm just really curious as you we're talking. You better edit all this. <laughs> <laughs> I said we could end on this, but oh, uh, and, oh. uh, but but as we're talking about this, um, you know, you kind of are like really figuring all this out, and whether or not you're going to be a performance artist or a musician, and what what all that means. I'm, I, when did the saw enter the picture for you? Um, well, the saw goes back a long way. Um, and, uh, you know, the saw was, it's funny, we get into some of this, um, in the show, mm. um, the live show, mostly, I think, I think season one of the audio show doesn't so much delve into this, but, um, you know, saws were like a complicated an interesting thing for me because when I was a kid they kind of symbolized a certain kind of violence sure. and um, you know a certain kind of danger yeah. and I wasn't good with tools 
um, and I wasn't really good with my hands, but I was, um, I was often, you know, I would try to assist, um, around the house with, with, you know, hold the board while it was being sawed or something like that or saw. And, um, and so my initial relationship with that object was, 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 a, was one with a very strong set of, of dark associations. Um, and then there was this kind of middle ground where like, you know, I would go into my grandmother's basement a lot for just being creative. I'd, I'd go down there and daydream, I'd make things up, I, you know, I'd play and the saws would kind of be there. And so it was... This is the same basement? Yeah, same basement. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and... They, they kind of took on this more neutral quality or in a weird way just seeing them hanging there was almost pleasant like because inert. you know they inert yeah. and reflecting yeah. light I mean they reflect light beautifully there were these Christmas lights in, that I'd put up that I'd found and I'd put them up uh, they were the, the old really pretty like uh, glass uh, yeah. like like um, ceramic ones mm-hmm. you know and um, and back then they'd last for years mm-hmm. they didn't make them like they do now to yeah. like last for like six months so and like they would reflect in the saws, you know, and and uh, and then I saw an old man in Central Park. Um, I call him an old man. He was probably like fifty or something, <laughs> you know. But um, but playing it, and I thought it was a magic trick. I didn't think it was real. Yeah. And um, and then so, but the saw was a really gradual thing, you know. I tried to play it for a really long time before any you know anyone else would ever recognize that music was coming out of it, you know, and. Uh, yeah. And hell, I think the first couple of years of Neutral Milk, I might have still been in that same stage. Like I hear you, some recordings. You were teaching yourself. I taught myself, yeah. Uh, and then I did go at one. I went on a a little pilgrimage to Moses Josea at a certain point. Moses um, is a New Yorker. He lives in Brownsville, and he's still he's still playing saw and and. Uh, but he Moses had done like played saw on a lot of the Disney soundtracks oh, in the fifties yeah. and stuff. And cool. uh, Walt Disney gave him a, a golden saw. <laughs> A gold-plated saw That's like, amazing. from Walt. Like he, Moses yeah. showed it to me, and I went out and visited him. And he showed me. He was alarmed when he saw how I played. <laughs> I, you know, that he said I would hurt myself, and yeah. so he kind of showed me how he holds it and how yeah. he sits it. And I adopted. I adopted holding it and sitting it. My tone is very different from Moses's because he's really into it. It's different quality of the sound. I was almost into it, the opposite quality. Mm. So our playing is very different, but I do play exactly the way that he does, like technique-wise. It's so funny. I I, I went to school in uh, Santa Cruz, and there's I don't like I don't know how small or, or large the saw community is, but there's a there was a guy who used to sit outside of a bookshop Santa Cruz and play the saw. I mean that was the first time I saw it in person. I think there's actually a statue to him now. Was it Charlie Blackwell? I would have is? to look it up. Okay, I can't yeah, remember the name, yeah. but I'm just wondering like, do all the saw people know each other? I think a lot of them do. I don't know many of them. Uh, I, I've always been uh, shy about entering into such culture. speci- specialized cultures. <laughs> I always feel yeah. like, yeah, just I'm shy, and it's, I think it's hard when you're shy, like to enter yeah. into something where everybody knows everybody. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, um, but uh, but so no, it was pretty magical for me, like seeing that you know the transformation of the saw into yeah something that could sing like an angel yeah um and that could that could be so magical and so beautiful um given that when i first met saws i saw them as these dangerous yeah dark creatures it was you know a pretty good metaphor for you know so much i think of what what i've i've found the world is like There you go. That was Julian Coster. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. I've been a fan of Julian's for some time now. Uh, first through Neutral Book Hotel, uh, through his uh, through his solo work. He has a, an awesome album that came out uh, a while back called "The Singing Saw at Christmas Time," which uh, I gave to my my mother as a as a, an alternative to all of her um, little too mellow George Winston music, and has, has worked its way into the uh, the heater holiday music repertoire of uh, Julian doing Christmas songs on the singing saw. Um, also, the Music Tapes, really, really wonderful band. They put out an album in uh, 2012 called Mary's Voice, which is just, it's you know, it's it's absolutely incredible. It, you know, I do think if you are a fan of, of Neutral Milk Hotel, it, it, you, you can certainly, there are certainly pieces of it, of it there. And, you know, it's clear that 
these two guys were very much informing one another's music, and, and there are a couple of songs on there that are just absolutely spectacular and, and have, have actually made made their way into the, the orbiting human circus. And in fact, um, I, I have seen the music tapes perform several times over the years, and uh, they were opening up for Jeff Mangum when he first started playing again after I think like 15 or so years. Uh, and they were the opening act, but... I mean, you never, you rarely see an opening act with with that kind of presentation. You know, they're opening up for, and granted, it was Chef Mango, but they're opening up for just a, a guy coming out and, and sitting on a seat and playing an acoustic guitar. And they were this uh, full band, and, and they had all these set pieces and uh, 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 like a talking television. Um, and when I heard that Julian was doing a podcast, especially. The fact that I heard he was doing a podcast with with the uh, in collaboration with the Nightfell guys, it, it made a lot of sense. You know, there, there's he, he he's definitely a storyteller. He definitely um, as 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 wonderful and, and amazing as as the music is. He's clearly always just working on on, on something bigger, and you kind of feel that every single piece that he puts out in the world is just a, a, a smaller piece of a, a larger puzzle and I think it's coming to, to fruition in an interesting way this is a it's a really good medium for him um, you know they're making good use of it I think uh, the Night Vale partnership is really great because uh, you're getting some some awesome radio drama and stuff that you know especially given budgets and things like that that you, you certainly um, you, you you just couldn't couldn't accomplish in, in another medium so always always awesome to see somebody doing something really innovative and interesting with the, with the podcast medium uh so thanks so much to him just uh, the the new episode of the the uh orbiting human circus is out uh, i think as, as about a week or two so definitely check that out check out the music tapes thanks to julian thanks to uh meryl for setting that up thanks to uh brian as always for editing the show together uh happy belated birthday to brian i think i'm about a month behind at this point uh thanks to you guys as always for listening to the program if you do enjoy the show please consider supporting us over on patreon even a, a dollar or two a show would 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 go uh, a ways to helping us pay for hosting costs and 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 helping to pay for Brian and the great job that he does. Uh, if you don't have any money to throw our way, please consider support the, rating us on uh, iTunes or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Uh, lots and lots and lots of good shows coming up, and we are nearing the 200th episode, so I feel like we uh, should do something fun for that. So, <laughs> so stick around, because uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have that figured out by then. And uh, stay tuned, because we will be back just about this time next week with another episode of R.I.Y.L. 